and actually what we really long for is people just to come and live their lives yeah. cross-culturally. Uh, we don't always need pastor teachers because you know, there's only one pastor teacher in the church necessarily or a few, but what we really need is people who are willing to live their lives and live their lives in a place where the only thing that explains why they're there is the gospel. Yeah. And that's just really compelling, isn't it? Radstock exists to equip and engage local churches to start new local churches in the world's toughest places. Find out more at radstock.org. Welcome to the latest edition of the Radstock Missions Podcast. My name is Steve Kaufman. Good evening, good evening. Is with me no. today. Oh, I love the way you say that. Say it again. Good evening, good evening. Ingi. Is that the middle bit? Ingi. 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 What does that bit mean? I mean, it's king. King. Yeah. Great. Warrior king. Warrior king. That's a good name. Yeah. That's a solid name. See? Thanks for letting me invade your church office and being with me. That's really, really appreciated. Uh, I want us to talk in this session just about uh, cross-cultural ministry and how people from other countries can help what's going on in Iceland. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking in my head, there is a... A school of thought which says, hey, let Icelanders reach Iceland, let Brits mm. reach Britain, let let Americans reach America. Um, and it kind of de-emphasizes the importance of cross-cultural ministry. So I just want you to talk to me for a little bit about that and what you see as being the need for and the role of churches from other places and other countries in the work of the gospel here in Iceland. Well, I mean, you think about it biblically, you think about the Great Commission that we have, you know, go out and, and make the nations yeah. the disciples of Christ. And you see how the disciples of Christ responded to that. And you see them going to different nations. Yeah. Right? You see Paul just kind of automatically going with that. And that's him planting churches all over the yeah. place. And so you, we're here today largely because outside churches got involved. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, yeah. And even if we start to think about that in, in terms of just here in Iceland, I mean, we had Arthur Cook in the, in the beginning of the 20th century. He came here from Britain and he was a Plymouth Brethren guy. He was the first guy to set up ever a radio station in Iceland. And it was a Christian station dedicated to, to the gospel. Wow. Um, he set up, uh, he, he learned the language. He started translating a bunch of theological works over to Icelandic. And actually, he's the, the reason why I'm here today in large part, you know, because I grew up in a church. And that's because a few decades ago, there was this 19-year-old communist handed a, a book that, that Arthur Cook translated by R.A. Torrey. And it called Jesus, uh, Atheism and Unbelief or something like that. Jesus, the Bible and Unbelief. Okay. And this communist, 19-year-old communist punk, started reading this book and he became a a follower of Christ, and that was my dad. Wow, okay. you know, so, you know, by some connection, I'm here because of faithfulness of outside, you know, guy, Arthur Cook from yeah. Britain coming over here. And, that's and interesting. I, I guess that, that mentality that says, hey, let's let Icelanders reach Iceland and Britain. Like, none of us would have heard the gospel if first century believers had taken the last Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that would, yeah, <laughs> it would have stayed in just yeah. Israel yeah. and never gone anywhere. Yeah. And so and to me, it's also like as much as I would love for Icelanders to, to take the ball and run with it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm also keeping in mind that hell is eternal and, and the consequences of, of what my, my, my brothers in the flesh, my sisters in the flesh, what they believe right now, what they do with Christ right now will, will you know, show their eternal destiny yeah, sure. and how they spend their eternal destiny. So as much as I would like for Icelanders just to take a ball and run with it, yeah. I'm more I'm more concerned with Icelanders hearing the gospel, yeah. Icelanders hearing the good news of Jesus rather than me getting to use my method methodology or preference. Yeah. And and especially in a country where almost everyone speaks in English. Yeah. I mean, okay, so the barriers are, are less than they might be in other yeah. places. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I'm, I guess I'm hearing a couple of things there. One is, actually, as you see that worked out in the New Testament, people are always going across cultural. Mm. I, I wonder the... Um, I, I think seeing that the, the gospel has within itself that desire to spread, doesn't it? See, like, like I, if I'm going to preach the gospel faithfully in, the, in a church that I belong to in Liverpool, 
I'm going to expect people to want to take it beyond the boundaries of their own community because that's that's even built in the gospel. Right? So there's that, and then there's the urgency of the gospel as well. So we we really are dealing with matters of eternity, aren't we? Yeah. So, um, and it's important work we we need to think carefully about uh, where gospel need is. I think sometimes we just forget that as churches. I mean, we fight over sometimes the most rid- ridiculous things. Yeah. And we were blindsided by you know the latest, latest and greatest you know whatever whatever is sharp and shiny yeah, you know yeah. catch our attention and meanwhile the reality is that there are souls dying and yeah. going to hell or meeting their makers and yeah. we need to see the seriousness of yeah. what we do as the church. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of fighting and bickering within the church would stop yeah. if we just remember how serious this is. And so, I, I guess if you didn't hear the previous podcast, listen to that because in that one you outlined just some of this, the great needs here in Iceland. So, I think you mentioned about five gospel churches in the in the island, and you know there's a there's a real need for uh, for mission here. So, what are, what are some of the helpful things that churches in other countries in other cultures can do to help uh, gospel ministry here in Iceland? Well, I think it would be uh, twofold. Would be um, financial contributions and sending people here long-term. Okay. Financial contributions so that we can have more people here long-term. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize because they're maybe from a different country where there's a lot of pastors and priests and you know, a lot of people doing the work of the ministry. Um, but here in Iceland, I mean, we've probably got four pastors outside of the state church that are working for churches. Wow. And so when, when you know, an American church, for instance, who's used to having churches all over the city, yeah, yeah. wants to bring a, a short-term mission group, they don't realize that there are four people on the ground that could be helping yeah, you logistically. Sure. Yeah. And, and short-term, you know, groups, they can be helpful, but they can also just kind of stop ministry. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. right now my ministry revolves about meeting with people over coffee. Yeah. And, you know, and sharing the gospel with them. We're helping them grow in their faith. And so a lot of that goes by the wayside when we have to logis- logistically think through all the different things yeah. that a group needs. Yeah. Airbnb, car, f- figure out stuff for them to do for the 10 days or seven days yeah. they're here. Then you have to kind of be with them for the seven days because they're in a foreign country and they yeah. don't know where to go. Yeah. And then sometimes there's stuff afterwards uh, yeah. that you need to take care of. We've had a couple of groups where... They just kind of messed up their Airbnb and kind of gave the church a bad name. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And so I've gone through Airbnbs and helped clean up. And, okay. And so... Which is know, taking you, ironically, is unhelpful as it is, it's taking you away from gospel ministry. Yeah. Kind of what doing. yeah. And so what I find to be very helpful is long-term focus. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's what people are here are looking for. Yeah. Um, they, they don't respond well to people just on the street saying, yeah. hey, can I tell you why you're wrong about the most important things in life? Yeah. You know, they, yeah. they may engage in debate for a little bit, but then at the end of the day, it's like, who's this guy? I don't know anything about him. Is he logical? Is he trustworthy? Like, I don't know. I'm just walking away. I, I think that's really helpful. I, I think we have lost sight sometimes about emissions. That actually, what we really long for is people just to come and live their lives yeah. cross-culturally. So that... Um, you know, so if I can say, uh, we don't always need pastor teachers because, you know, there's only one kind of pastor teacher in a church necessarily or a few, but, you know, not everybody yeah. is. What we really need is people who will be willing to live their lives and live their lives in a place where the only thing that explains why they're there is the gospel. Yeah. Um, and that's just really compelling, isn't it? Oh, like, like certain people you may have met here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, we got a few groups of these people. We got people, um, you know, who, who live in countries that may be a part of, uh, what is it, Schengen Zone? Okay, yeah. That, that's easy to move here and, yeah. and live here. And they just move here and live here because they like Iceland. They want to help. They get jobs, become members of the church, and they use their gifts to serve the church and, and Iceland. And then you got others who are, for instance, the guy leading our university ministry. He's from Portland, Oregon. Okay. Uh, the university here is super cheap. Uh, it's subsidized by the government. It's super expensive in the U.S. So he figured, I want to be gone through the gospel ministry in a godless country. Yeah, Iceland is a good candidate. Yeah. Iceland is super cheap university ministry. So I'm going to university. So I'm going to go there, and I'm going to study, and I'm going to start a university ministry. And now he's he's got a Bible 
gathering with the students on campus, a few students, but he's also got social events like movie nights every week and American football nights on Sunday nights. And he's starting to gather like his whole dorm into, dorm into yeah. this, this fellowship of, you know, around these few believers there. Right. And that's sparking off awesome conversations. Then you got a church like in Maryland who's got a heart for this one specific city. And, and I assume they're just going to be praying for that. Yeah. And because of their people praying for that, now you've got couples in their church asking themselves, okay, what do we do after we retire? Yeah. retire? Like the husband is about to retire from the military. And they're thinking, do we go to Iceland? Yeah. You know, do, do we do these things? So there, you can be... It doesn't have to be a teacher or a pastor yeah. to yeah. to do this. You you are an ambassador of Christ, uh, no matter you know if you're an elder or a teacher in a church or if you're just a member. I mean, so finances, because the church is not financially self-sustaining. Um, long-term workers, not just pastor teachers, but students, people are just willing to come here, and live, work, live their lives here, and contribute to the good of the local church. Those are, the, those are the big ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'd say that most definitely those are the biggest ways that people can help. Um, just, uh, just then help us think, what is the, uh, like a church then that's got, I guess, a number of different nationalities in the church. Uh, is that, how does that help with gospel ministry? So uh, we were discussing earlier, just coming to your church on a Sunday and seeing the, the number of different nationalities. Yeah. Involved. Uh, how does that help in in your task? I think it gets people asking, like, why why are all these people here? Mm. Uh, why are uh, I think it's a beautiful image. First off, that we are we have different backgrounds, we have different cultures, we have different languages. Even you know we have uh, different expectations, but here we are tied together as family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's just a beautiful image, especially in a time where there's a lot of, you know, like in the world in general, there's a lot of uh, divisions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of focus on, you know, racial issues and so on and so forth. And just seeing a family come together to worship their one true father. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah it, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Just also getting to, you know, getting to know my brothers and sisters in Ireland and seeing how different the culture is there and the emphases at, at, versus my brothers and sisters in South Africa or yeah, Ghana. Yeah. And, and seeing what is shocking to them about our church. You know, like, uh, and, and all of which helps you focus on the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Right? Because it's actually it's, it's in him that we're united. Yeah. It? It's not in these other things. Yeah. And there's so much stuff that could you know, cause disunity among us, yeah. certainly. You know, some, some of it is not bad. Like, there's yeah. disunity in us not sharing the same language. And yeah. we're trying to figure out as a church, like, okay, what language do we speak? Right. Because we can speak Icelandic, and half the people here know what, what we're talking about. Right. And the other half doesn't. Um, you know, what does what this look like? But it's Icelanders that you want them to reach. So you, yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we started Icelandic doing time. two services, for instance, in English and in Icelandic. And I think partially because everyone kind of felt like we're one family. Yeah. The Icelanders just stopped going to the Icelandic service and just started coming to the English. Yeah. There was like yeah. one Icelander in the Icelandic <laughs> service. And we're like, do you mind if we just go to English? Yeah. And they're like, yeah. And so, like, I, I do want an Icelandic service yeah. uh, eventually, but I, I think I, it would almost have to be like a, a church plant within the church of right. like, okay. You five guys, you're not going to go to the English service. No, yeah, we're going yeah, to stay yeah. there and we're going to, you know, focus on building up this this Icelandic. And that's kind of uniquely Iceland, isn't it? In a sense, it's a, almost a bilingual culture, isn't it? In a, in a yeah. Sense. And I kind of, I'm skeptical that the language will survive the next 50 years. Okay. Yeah. I think it will kind of become like Gaelic in, in Ireland. Okay. That's what, that's what I think. Right. Especially with modern technology, you can talk to and so on and so forth. That sounds like another topic. Then. Yeah. Nice to hear that. Yeah. Nice to hear that. Um, I, I wanted to also ask you what the uh, what you've done as a church to be involved in mission elsewhere as well. Like, have you have you done anything in, in that, and how has that helped you? Is that a distraction? Should we just let churches that are established, you guys, get on with what you're doing? Don't worry about the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean. Um, 
we have we have basically focused on on Belarus yeah and contributing financially to a church planner in Belarus who's doing awesome awesome work there yeah. and who we just really love and his family we've gotten to know him throughout the years and that's what I hope our church will become is not a church that's you know has all these pins on the map all over the world but yeah. rather substantially is supporting this one guy on the ground because yeah. I know what it, what it feels like to have 16 supporting churches okay. and, and trying to keep them in on the loop and want to travel to them regularly but it's just difficult you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and so so I, I'm hoping we can become more of like man if if it, our guy in Belarus can just keep on working and yeah. we can just pay his full time pay that would yeah. be perfect to me yeah yeah he, he wouldn't have to risk you know, be responsible to anyone else, just yeah, just yeah. us. And he knows we're praying for him, and he knows he doesn't have any responsibility towards us. We just want to see the gospel advance. So, yeah. and so we've sent Nonne there to to help him out in one of his campaigns. He does a lot of yeah. youth campaigns and that type of stuff. And that's interesting, isn't it? The, the sort of relational aspect of that, saying building relationships to yeah. help the church see that is is an important step forward. What? Why is that? So. What is so unhelpful about the ping on the map thing? I mean, no, well, because I I don't want to. I'm not saying that it's bad to help too many churches. Yeah. I'm just saying I want to help each church that we do help significantly. Yeah. So that they don't have to have twenty churches supporting them to to do their work okay. and feel responsible to report to every one of them or yeah. visit regularly. Um, because I know what it feels like to have all these. Yeah. You have all these people you've never met, yeah. and they're giving you money. Yeah. And even though, even if they're not saying you need to come here every eight months or twelve months, or you feel the like, pressure yeah, of like, yeah. hey, I want to, I want to show my face to these people who've been sacrificially giving, yeah. and and so that's what I I hope. Like I wouldn't mind having a bunch of pins on a map, but I would rather have like. Fewer yeah. and know that each pain we're supporting very significantly. That's uh, interesting, though, isn't it? Because the way you describe that is the pin on the map thing. It's not. It's not so much that it's unhelpful for your church. It's unhelpful for the people who are the pins, right? Because they they yeah, all of a sudden have this huge network that they're trying to maintain. Because but, I mean, I, I would know. I, I would want to have two pins up there if I know we can do two thousand a month for okay, both of them. You yeah, know? yeah, and that could pay off. The groceries for the month instead of yeah. one meal out. Yeah, you know, maybe yeah. I'll we'll give them fifty bucks in. Yeah. But yeah, it's a pin up there, but yeah. it's one meal a month that they can eat out. Because I was thinking about it from the other point of view as well, that the pins on the map for for us as pastors, it just means that our connection with global mission is just so vague. Yeah. Say, so, well, how do how do I know the gospel of pain to the nations? Well, look at my map. Uh, Whereas if you've got significant relationships with people in other cultures, you're going, Oh no! Look, because I know this guy, and I'm praying for this guy. I'm praying for his family. I'm, I'm praying for his ministry. He's, you know, he's been sick, yeah. and we've contributed to his medical bills, and we've done this, and you know, and I've I've been, and, you know, yeah. and that just seems a much more powerful way of of the gospel to the nations coming alive for each of our individual members. And that's what we do. Like every Sunday, we pray for our partner of the week, for instance, okay. yeah, either a partner in church or. or that's help partnering with us to help with gospel stuff on the ground in Iceland or we're partnering with yeah. uh, like our guy in, in Belarus. Um, and like we pray for one of them every week. So we, we get updates as to what's going yeah. on. And, and so that, that's that been really helpful for us in, in the regard that we remember though even, we're, even though we're stuck on an island, yeah. we're a part of a bigger network and a bigger family. Yeah. And um, actually, yeah, I, my hope is to, to print out pictures of all these different churches that we may not be supporting, but we're connected with in one yeah. way or another. Yeah. And it's just so that people can Get have their them, pictures, yeah. pray for them, know that we're still a part of this family. And that's tangible. I mean, when, when my son got diagnosed with cancer, there was a pastor here in two weeks. Yeah. Just saying, I'm, I'm spending my summer here with my family. Don't worry about the pulpit. That's amazing. Focus on your son. And people know, like, these relationships yeah. are not just something like paper thin. This yeah, is yeah. legitimate relationships. Yeah. And um, for sure, um, you are more than a pin on the map. Yeah, like, way more, yeah. way more. And, I mean, the church there, they heard we had cancer. They're, 
figure, okay, how do we send a six person family to Iceland? What, what does Airbnb cost for yeah. three months? And they just like, okay, we need to raise these thousands of dollars and wow. did it in a couple of weeks and sent them our way. And it was just, yeah, yeah that's it was something else. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful, isn't it? So going back to our original question, what involvement do churches from other countries have in the work of the gospel in Iceland? Well, actually, we're all working for the kingdom of yeah. God together. Actually, we have a responsibility to one another. There's a great need here. There's a real opportunity here. Um, and, uh, and so we should be engaged. And you have members from these supporting churches that come here. And they're just, they love on our people. I mean, yeah. they're, they're not here to be like, spending every second of the day being missional. They just yeah. learn how the culture works. They know how to get a car, how the bus system works, how, how to get an Airbnb. Yeah. They just come and hang out for a week. And like some ladies that come over here, our women in the church love them because they just like, can I help you with dinner? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's amazing the impact of these kind of trips. Like yeah. we got a lady right now who's coming four times this year. Wow. Just to hang out with our ladies, just to see if, if she can be praying for them or helping. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be your typical ministry yeah. kind of trip. Yeah. But there's a role yeah. for the churches. We're not just letting Icelanders get on with reaching Icelanders. We're actually a, a global family of churches that need to work together. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's really helpful. Thank you, Brian.